Hello, everybody. Welcome to uh, the webinar. I'm Kevin. I will be with you for the next, well, however long it takes to go through some pictures, talk about some editing and uh, answer some questions. Uh, the webinar is, of course, um, put together by BenQ Europe. Um, and uh, we'll talk a little bit, just a little bit, about uh, color calibration and monitors and stuff like that as we go through. Now, feel free to uh, use the the um, uh, the box on the presumably on the right hand side. It's on the right hand side of my screen for uh, answer asking questions. And uh, Alexandra is on the on the line, kind of monitoring all of that stuff, and she'll fire them through to me. We'll either answer them as we go through. Or maybe we'll do them at the end, one way or the other. We'll try and get through them. Um, so yeah, no, no problem. But any questions you want to ask, I will answer as many as I can, as honestly as I can. So uh, with that in mind, I'm going to switch off my face. Nobody really wants to look at my face, and uh, we will get started. Okay, so uh, we are going to talk about authentic and emotion-driven documentary wedding photography. Um, now, the first thing that is uh, important for me to tell you about is a very, very brief history of my journey into photography or wedding photography, I should say. And uh, it all started back in 2008. I've been shooting for uh, 14 years or so. It seems incredible. Um, before, before then, at that point in time, I was never a photographer. I had no ambition to be a photographer. And uh, I was working in, in IT, like many people who kind of turned to wedding photography were and uh, I just got basically burnt out and decided I needed to do something very different um, and one day I was on the tube driving home or coming home and uh, picked up one of those free magazines that you get on uh, on the tubes and uh, it was a magazine article about weddings now uh, I'd recently been married so I wasn't interested in weddings anymore but uh, so I was about to flick over and then I just captured, I just saw with the corner of my eye, these uh, these beautiful black and white documentary wedding pictures uh, in the corner. Uh, they were actually by a photo wonderful photographer called Jeff Askoff. And uh, I looked at these pictures and I thought, wow, these are amazing. I never even thought this was a thing at weddings. Uh, so I went home to my wife and I said, you know what, I'm going to do this. This is this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to be a wedding photographer and I'm going to do it just like this. Uh, and it's going to be really easy and it will be no problem. It's the answer to all of our problems. Um, and of course, it isn't easy. Um, but I did it. She did say to me that, you know, you need to buy a camera and you need to smile a bit more and be a bit less miserable. Um, but we did it 14 years later, 500 and I don't know, 75 weddings or so later. Uh, anyway, so uh what what drives me with photography i think is this element of emotion um and certainly for wedding photography and uh you can see that quote there it says photography for me is not looking it's feeling if you can't feel what you're looking at then you're never going to get others to feel anything when they look at your pictures either and that's don mccullen very famous uh mostly uh kind of conflict photographer but uh, just generally a wonderful documentary photographer um, and I think that's really important. And as, as it says there at the bottom, making pictures that matter, feeling first, technique second. So uh, as we go through these images, I'm not going to be telling you exactly kind of what aperture and shutter speed and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, it's important to understand your cameras and how you use them. Um, but actually, it's more important to get the image I feel. So as it says there, feeling first, technique second. Um, and to that end, actually, most of the, a lot of the images that I take these days, now that cameras are more capable, are in uh, what you might commonly call as P mode. Uh, in the Fujifilm world, that's everything on A, which means the camera is doing all of the, the thinking and we're just doing the looking. So what is documentary wedding photography? Um, uh, candid, reportage, photojournalism, all those three things are relevant. And to me, it's really, really important that I um, maintain the integrity of those terms. And uh, it, to that end, what, what this effectively means is that it's candid, okay? Candid photography, that's, that's usually the words that potential clients will more than likely understand. Um, now, candid is an adjective, so you either shoot it candidly or you don't. So to give you an example of that, if I was taking a photograph of a I don't know, cup of coffee on my desk, uh, the moment I adjust the lights or I move the coffee to make the composition a little bit better, it's, it's actually no longer candid. Um, and the way that manifests itself in wedding photography is that, or the way that I approach my documentary wedding photography, is that I will not 
um, uh, massage the images, I will not move things, I will move myself of course, I will try and understand the holy trinity of light, composition and moments, but I won't direct, I won't move or anything like that. So it's pure candid. No, just because this is the way that I do it, it does not mean it's the only way to do it. Of course, I've got very many good friends who uh, combine beautiful editorial photography along with documentary photography. Uh, is, there's certainly no right way to do it or only way to do it, I should say. Um, but I will say you must do it in a way that you enjoy. Uh, nobody wants to spend their Saturdays at other people's weddings without enjoying it, right? Um, and that, that element there, as you can see in the bottom uh, right hand side, says nostalgia. So I want my clients in 40 years time to open their wedding album and look at an image and, and actually remember that moment happening rather than thinking, oh yeah, do you remember when the photographer made us do this? Uh, that's critical to me, really, really very important. And you know, if you think back to the images of your own youth, your own childhood, your own past, uh, uh, you know, if I said to you now, you know, which which of think of one image that you remember from your childhood and which is, you know, which is your favorite, uh, chances are it will be, I don't know, a picture on the beach with your family, maybe a Christmas, a family holiday, something like that. It's unlikely to be a school portrait or, a, you know, a group shot in uh, in your works office or something, you know. So it's it's very important to me that this idea of nostalgia is is carried through. Um, and I often say to people, uh, including my clients, that uh, a picture that might well be benign today may well be very, very important in the future. So it, that's always worth bearing in mind. Okay, so emotion. Um, now, uh, emotion in wedding photography is essentially, it starts with your eyes. And uh, as I said at the beginning, this, this idea of uh, shooting in P mode, if you like, or A mode, the, ultimately our responsibility as a photographer is to look for the images. That's that's critical. If you if you're spending too much time worrying about changing lenses or, you know, what aperture should I shoot this at, etc., then you may well miss those opportunities. And so, you know, if you take one thing away from today or this session, um, I hope that it's this idea that we are uh, observers and storytellers primarily. Of course, photography is is the technique, um, but really we're there to to tell a story for our clients. Um, and I specifically look out for these kind of very emotional, uh, tactile moments. So, for example, we have this image here. Um, this was a wedding in the south of France, uh, and it was an, an American couple, and they brought their uh, both their families over from America and their friends. And the reason they come over to the south of France was because the grandmother, as you can see in this frame, was uh, living in the south of France and, and couldn't travel. Uh, this is probably five or six years ago. Um, now, I I overheard somebody telling a story, of, telling the story of this. I did not know why they were in the South of France getting married. I just assumed perhaps that's what they wanted to do. So I did not know that added element of the grandmother. So armed with that new knowledge that I, I picked up with my ears, because ear, you know listening is a very important element of being a good documentary photographer too. Um, I kept an eye out for this interaction immediately after the wedding ceremony. So as soon as the bride approaches the grandmother, I keep this in mind. I actually have the camera at my chest level at this point. It's not at my eye level. Um, one, two frames, maybe three maximum, and then move away. The absolute critical and most important thing to me is that these moments do not just get wiped from the face of history because of my presence. So if I'm stood there taking five, 10, 15, 20, 30 pictures, uh, mostly the granny will probably think, oh, the photographer's there and will maybe want to take a little bit more of a formal picture, et cetera. But the most crucial thing is that this interaction, the eye contact, the hands, uh, the obvious love between the two of them, just doesn't never happen because of my presence. So it's very, very important to behave like a guest, be like a guest, um, get in, take the pictures, move away, rather than trying to orchestrate any of these moments. Uh, if you're trying to shoot it as pure documentary, storytelling, candid photographer. So we have uh, another image from many years ago. In fact, uh, this is in my, my church, local church in Malmesbury, where I, where I am right now. Um, and this is dad straight after the ceremony, uh, you know, giving his, uh, his daughter a, a nice big hug. Um, and, you, you know, you can see the emotion on the face. You can see it. It's uh, compositionally, it's not going to win any awards. We've got all kinds of uh, other things going on in the corners and the edges. But actually, it's probably one of my favorite pictures. 
um, just because of that pure, raw, uh, you know, emotion, dad, daughter, beautiful, beautiful picture, I think. And we have another one here. This was shot with a uh, point of shoot camera X100S. Um, again, probably eight or nine years ago, I think this one was. Um, and it's another one where hearing and using my ears has allowed me to uh, bring this picture to life. Um, and that's essentially because the, um, the bride had said to her sister uh, the night before, this is a Sikh wedding, uh, probably about five o'clock in the morning, and they had a Hindu ceremony the day before, uh, that you know her auntie was coming over from India. She hadn't seen it for a very long time. Would be there in the morning, and so keeping that in mind, I'm I'm looking out for that particular image and just getting in close, one click, two clicks maximum, moving away, and letting them have their moment together. Okay, similar image here. Um, now I understand there might be a little bit of a delay flicking between the images. Um, that might be to do with the internet, but uh, you, you should be catching up with me now. So we have a we have a, a grandmother and uh, being comforted a little bit, maybe comforted is the wrong word, by a bridesmaid. Um, and uh, what's going on in this scene is I'm actually, I was actually photographing uh, the bride who you can see in the foreground, you can see the uh, wedding dress in the foreground, or shooting over her shoulder, the hugs, the laughter, all of that kind of stuff. And uh, out of the corner of my eye, I saw the grandmother um, who was you know, getting a little bit emotional. And then the sister who was the bridesmaid just reaching out and, and kind of giving her this little gentle uh, face touch. So, you know, that, that, that combination of eye contact and hands, humanity touching each other is so powerful. Um, you know, we use our hands for everything, for eating, for living, for scratching, everything is used for your hands. And our, our eyes are used to um, uh, transmit every single part of our being in terms of emotions, you know, our anger, our love, our affections. Um, and if, you, if you're armed with that knowledge and you, you're looking for that, then you will almost definitely make more powerful emotion-driven pictures. Uh, okay, so this one is actually from my most recent wedding, which is a couple of weeks ago. Um, and in this case, we have the father of the bride. The bride is sat to the, uh, the father's left, uh, to the father's right, our left, and the lady giving the father a, a little uh, peck on the peck on the head. There is the groom's mum, and it's a re really lovely little moment because they were um, neither of them had their relative partners any longer, um, and it was just after the speeches, and the groom's mum had just come along and you know just kind of put a gentle arm around around the bride's dad and, uh, and said, yeah, you know what, it's been a lovely day. Okay, so <clears throat> one of the things that are it's hard not to do, or do it myself, is to uh, effectively take snapshots. Um, and uh, snapshots or record shots is probably a better way of uh, referring to it. So record shots I would class as essentially just kind of head and shoulder shots, candid pictures still, but head and shoulder shots of people who are at the wedding. Um, and they are, they're important actually, they're still relevant, uh, but a whole day of just head and shoulder shots of people at the wedding is not really going to tell the story of the day. doesn't mean the pictures will be bad, but it's not necessarily going to tell the story of the day. Um, and you can help yourself by using wider lenses, smaller cameras, all of that kind of stuff, uh, rather than standing by a tree with a perhaps a 70 to 200 mil lens and you know just kind of going for those very close images. Think about these, these elements on the right-hand side. You've got human interaction, as we talked about, humor, looking for humor throughout the day, and eye contact. Um, it really is important. I have these things written on the inside of my camera bag, so at every wedding, I, uh, I remind myself of the things that I want to look for. Um, and there you go, feeling first, technique second. That's, uh, it's critical all the time, so critical. Um, you know, and I, I'm, I, I'm as guilty as everybody else. I've missed pictures because I've been chimping. I've missed pictures because I've been worrying about whether the shutter speed is fast enough. Um, but actually that moment that exists at the wedding is fleeting, very fleeting. Uh, and it's just about keeping your eyes open and looking for it, being an observer. 
Uh, and essentially, this is it. This is this is one of the things that I say to my clients all the time. It's just people being people. Yes, they're at a wedding, um, but it is just people being normal, interacting with each other. Sometimes it's the first time they've seen each other for a while, uh, but it's it really is about this observation of people. It doesn't necessarily have to be clever, uh, but you do need to keep that in mind that it's a um, very, for a storytelling element of things, it's very much about the people and their interactions with each other. Okay, so here's that lady again, <laughs> bless her. She was uh, from a couple of weeks ago. Um, just, you know, giving the best man a little bit of a warning before the speech is. Uh, you know, I wasn't privy to the conversation, but I can imagine there was a few uh, little warning words there about uh, stories gone by and what he's allowed to say and what he's not allowed to say. Um, you know, it's a, it's a nice, fun, uh, humor setting image for the speeches ahead. Um, okay, so here we are, bridal prep. This is uh, early in the morning before the uh, before the wedding, of course. Uh, and as I said, remember, it's it's just people being people. So, you know, just I've been photographing the bride, I think, having her hair done, makeup, um, dart into the kitchen, see what's going on in there. And uh, you know, we've got this lovely scene here with all of the bridesmaids who are busy wrapping up the napkins, uh, ready for the day ahead. Probably should have been done the night before, but maybe they were uh, too busy having some Prosecco. Um, but the, you know, we have a, a lot of players, a lot of main characters in the, in the wedding are here. Dad's there. Uh, telling his son off or something or other, and then everybody else is there. And then you know, you've got that lovely little baby on the corner who's just thinking, no idea what's going on, but I've got my sandwich and I'm very happy. Um, so like I said, none of the images are, are clever. There's nothing clever about it. It's just about trying to understand what's going on. Um, and critically, the light is important. And we'll get to talk about light a little bit later on. Okay, so dancing, again, from a wedding recently, just before Christmas um you know it's it, there's always uh fun elements going on once the once the speeches are done and people are relaxing uh and the dancing is going then uh it's time to it's almost time to kind of let your hair down as a photographer as well because that is where you can start or i feel like i can start exploring and looking for those very very quirky those fun moments that uh you know people will remember for for a very long time uh okay so here uh, enough said about this, I think. Gru uh, vicar, Ma, and a, a lady. And it turns out, I didn't know this at the time, but it does turn out that the groom was the vicar's dad and the lady is the vicar. Sorry, the, uh, the, the vicar is the groom's dad and the lady is the groom's mum. And so, yeah, a little bit of uh, what the vicar did next, perhaps, in that image. This is one of my favourite pictures of all times. Uh, seems a little bit um, irrelevant, but I was waiting for something interesting to happen in that mirror. Uh, sadly, didn't. So I'm not going to Photoshop anything in there. Um, but I, uh, I love it because this is a very typical English wedding. We've got two men who do not want to be there, and two ladies who are loving it. Uh, the chaps are probably thinking, oh, I could be watching a cricket right now, and the ladies having a jolly old time. Uh, and it's a real good observation of, uh, of weddings. I see it a lot, actually. And perhaps they, you know, yeah, they probably did want to be there and had a lovely time. But at that point, they certainly didn't look like they were enjoying it. Uh, cake, cake cutting, in this case. Um, tumble, cake's about to tumble, hands everywhere to try and stop it. Um, nice close-up picture. Uh, this was a very, this is a really fun wedding, actually. Uh, late at night, lots of uh, merriment had been going on. They decided to cut the cake much later than they perhaps would have done. Um, and uh, yeah, really, really fun. Lots of uh, lots of things going on at that wedding. So this is a very different type of picture to that previous one. Um, and perhaps. Uh, you know, the, the, we have we have time for fun and, and humor and everything, but we also have time for, as I said right at the beginning, nostalgia. Nostalgia is super, super important. So here we've got the bride who's uh, just the, the image is cropped, unfortunately, for uh, for this presentation this is a little bit missing on the right hand side. Uh, not too much. But so the bride is, uh, you know, she's she's contemplating the day ahead. This is during bridal prep. And she's getting uh, ready in uh, mum and dad's room. And, and obviously in the background, we see dads getting, uh, putting his shirt on. But what I love about this picture is, is the clutter, the stuff on the mantelpiece, the old photos on the wall, uh, the furniture, that four poster bed, all of these things will go away at some point. Um, and right now, uh, you know, it's a couple of years old, this, this image, the bride will look at this picture and remember her wedding day. 
give it 10, 20, 30 years time, she'll look at this picture and remember the house and the parents and the, uh, the furniture and how that room was and perhaps how she played in that room as a little girl. All of these things are going to come and be so, so important in the future. Okay, so let's see what happens next. There we go. Um, this is the same bride, and you know, I think sometimes we, uh, you know, we get lost in this idea of trying to make clever images and a uh, nice play on light and all of that kind of stuff. And it's important. However, the most important thing is the is the romance, is the love between the people, and the ceremony, and uh, that is critically what they want you to photograph. Um, everything else is a bonus, but it is really still important to get the beautiful, um, within as much reason as you possibly can, uh, shots of the of the standard kind of elements of a Western wedding in the UK at least. So the first kiss is a, is a critical moment and one that, uh, if it's not out of your control, should be one that you are, you are absolutely uh, getting right every single time. Okay, so this is, again, I'm walking through this wedding. It's, all, it's like a little mini story. Um, so this is the uh, confetti line. They're about to run down this aisle, uh, get confetti thrown all over them. One of the things I love to do is put my, myself in their place if there's time. So I'll, I'll photograph down that line. This is what they're going to see. This is what they're seeing in a couple of moments' time. Um, and this is a brilliant group shot. You know, this is, this is my idea of a perfect group shot. We've got everything going on here, lots of stuff. Um, and, you know, in, in any kind of circumstance, this is the picture that your eyes will be drawn around and look at different people and all kinds of good things going on. And this is them just about to come out of where I was stood, um, run down that aisle, I run down that confetti line. Um, but again, you know, the standard important stuff is very critical. Everything else is uh, of interest. A uh, little lad here, um, his dad was just throwing him up in the air. Uh, I'm not sure whether he was uh, he was about to be ill or not. But he was going very high up, um, but it's nice, you know. It's a nice little portrait of the lad at the wedding. Um, okay, so remember, we're talking about um, you know getting close, being kind of very, very much a guest at the wedding. And one of the things that I do like to do with the uh, confetti element of things is once they've they're kind of running towards me, is I'll, I'll I'll get that shot of course, and then I'll just step into the line. I'll step into the uh, confetti line with the the, congregate, uh, the guests are um, and you know we get this lovely element in this picture with the hands over the top and the you know the the cones of confetti really is very much a frame filling picture that that uh, is from a guest eye point of view rather than a more traditional photographer's point of view. Um, yeah, the uh, you know these interactions this is like the, the hugathon as I would call it. It's the bread and butter time uh, happens after every single wedding. And uh, the most important thing is to not get in the way and not make it about you. Um, certainly I feel this, so I'm always light allowing, always behind the bride, um, taking those images of people as they approach her. Yeah, it's another example of that kind of thing going on. Um, you know, it's the first time the bride's really going to notice you after the ceremony, so she doesn't want to see you kind of right in front of her all the time. Double hug, little bonus points for double hugs. Um, you can get them if you try. Right down on the dance floor, uh, here we are kind of uh, getting right in the mix. Um, one of the questions from uh, Daniel that I've just seen pop up is, do you ever use flash at all? Uh, and the answer is no, I do not use flash at all. Um, I do, however, in, and in this case, this is what a uh, good example in this image, I am using a very small LED light. Um, it's a uh, Manfrotto Lumimuse. Uh, it's the size of a matchbox. I charge it once. It lasts about three years. Um, and I only use it when I need to. So I prefer not to use any artificial light at all, but sometimes you do need to use it. I just hold it in one hand. I can direct the light and I can move the camera around with the other hand. Uh, another really nice picture that I like from a, uh, a, a photographer's wedding a few years back. Um, you know, it's that element of uh, movement, isn't it? That, that great big smile on his face. How happy is he? Uh, you know, and uh, it's beautiful. I really love it. And, and you know, it's if this was entered into a competition, they'd discard it. You know, oh, it's, you know, it's not sharp enough. Composition is not quite right. Um, but you know what? It doesn't really matter, does it? It's all about that, that smiley face. 
Um, okay, when we think about light and, uh, you know, composition and movement, they really are the three things that you need to think about when you're taking a picture of anything, light, composition and movement, no matter whether it's a studio shot or a landscape or a wedding picture. If you get the light right and you get the composition right and you get the moment right, then it will be a, a killer picture. So here we have Dad and the Bride walking down the aisle and there's a nice pool of light that falls down in the middle of this church. And so replicating that, same bride, now with her husband, dad's in the background there, you can just see him um, coming back up the aisle, just straight after, you know, I don't know half an hour later or whatever. Um, same pool of light, same thing. So just uh, kind of getting cohesion in things there. Um, so here we have this, uh, this beautiful bride who um, was waiting for her dad to come into the room for, uh, you know, to take her to the ceremony. Um, and I'm, I'm kind of backed in, I'm backed onto the wall here. I'm waiting for, for him to come also. Um, but this light's flowing and it's flooding in and it's a nice opportunity to get a detail shot, what I would class as a detail shot. And, you know, the brides will spend a lot of money on their wedding dress, of course, uh, and they want to see the details. It doesn't mean that it has to necessarily, or certainly not in my case, be kind of laid out, hung up on a, uh, a table or a tree or whatever, but I will ensure that I get detailed shots of the wedding dress throughout the day in different circumstances, but totally candidly as well. You can do that very easily. Um, this is a lovely picture of my friend Pete and Jeannie um, get married. And, and, you know, this is the during the signing of the register, uh, you know, all these little moments that are flooding around, buzzing around, um, you know, it's it's this stuff, the stuff that's going on. You know, Martin Parr would always say it's the extraordinary and the ordinary. Um, they're the moments that you want to try and keep your eyes open to. In this case, uh, you know, we've got the eye contact again. We've got the lovely, the lovely, beautiful smiles on the uh, mother's face and the grandmother's face on the right hand side. And then obviously the dad and the, the a bride. Uh, coming towards the groom, uh, coming down the aisle, straight over the shoulder, wonderful. Now, one thing that happens at every single wedding, regardless where it is, uh, is the first time that they will clasp eyes on each other, if you like, connect eyes. Um, and that's something that, uh, again, this, us as an observer will give us, if we know that this is going to happen, we can look for it. Doesn't mean we'll always get it, but we can look for it. That very first moment, uh, quite often the groom will turn and look up the aisle and there will be a glance from the bride. Uh, sometimes they don't. Sometimes they wait till right at the very end before they turn. Um, and it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a really beautiful moment. Okay, so uh, again, light is important here and also context. So we have a, a little bit of the wedding dress hanging up. Um, and obviously you can see the bride is sat in the bridal chair. Uh, and then fortuitously, actually, I'm not even sure if they're her wedding dress, uh, wedding shoes or the mum's, but uh, there are some shoes there. I'm not very good at wedding shoes. Um, but, you know, it's a nice way of connecting a few things together and, and why, you know, broadening the viewpoint and uh, seeing extra things that are happening, the extraordinary and the ordinary. Uh, same wedding, a um, lot of prep going on, as we can see. I'm not a huge fan of uh, photos of people with their with the eye uh, makeup going on when when you can't when they're not doing it on the same side. So it would be better in terms of the image if the eye pencil, if that's what they're called, is uh, was going on, on the right hand side. Um, however, it's not. And uh, what we do have though is that lovely kind of layered story in the background. Um, uh, eyeliner. Thank you. Thank you. Somebody's just told me eyeliner. There we go. <laughs> it's been a long time since I've worn any of that. Um, and, uh, you know, we have this layered story in the background. So keeping it wide, keeping your eyes open constantly is going to, uh, going to allow me to, you know, to, to, to really tell this story of the day. Um, and, you know, sometimes people feel afraid of going wide, I find, when they're trying to, to shoot this stuff. And actually, sometimes wide is the only way. Um, you know, I shoot with an 18 mil and a 56 mil lens, and 18 mil is beautiful for getting this stuff. And then I can flip to the 56 if I need to to get some more close up stuff. Um, but this is a you know really lovely picture. We've got a lot of good stuff going on here. Um, there, there's uh, symmetry in the bride in the bridesmaid holding the glass up, and the groom, of course, and everybody else is just happy. It's just a really really nice picture. Uh, that could only really come about by by having a wide angle lens available to me. 
Uh, again, going back some years here, this is a, uh, a another picture that almost every time I see this and I share this, I uh, I see something different. Again, it's cropped, so there's elements on the edges that are missing. Um, but this is a you know this is an interesting picture. You kind of your eyes gaze around it. We've got the venue in the background, which happens to be the family home, but it's it's still the wedding venue. Um, and we've got, you know, we've got that little baby having a tantrum in the middle on the floor. We've got a little girl with a balloon. There's a, a lady there with a blow up horse. We've got a guy sat on the fence at the back who's, uh, you know, just by himself, really doing much, wondering where all his friends are. Uh, and we've got all kinds of things going on here. Um, my only regret with this picture was that in those days I was shooting with a 23 mil lens, which in full frame equivalent is 35. Um, 18 mil would have given me even more, but I didn't, I wasn't shooting with 18 mil in those days. Stonehenge, another 5 a.m. wedding, um, and uh, yeah, so you know the venue, the details, the context are super important. Um, I didn't just want to take a picture of Stonehenge; it's been photographed a bazillion times. So as we were, uh, they take you up in a little bus, and as they uh, they were getting off to walk up to the uh, to the to the stones for the ceremony, you can just about see the druids there in the in the foreground. Um, uh, you know, I wanted to get this picture of them kind of a, a go into their destiny, if you like, and their, their children were with them. The little boy, bless him, was dressed as Thor. Um, and uh, yeah, it was a wonderful, wonderful day, wonderful wedding. Um, unfortunately, the sun didn't come up. It was the day before the midsummer solstice, I think, but the sun didn't really rise. Typical Britain. Uh, here we have another lovely little picture, little bridesmaid. Probably spent the last 18 months getting super excited about this wedding day. Uh, you know, anti whatever is getting married. I can't wait. I'm going to be the princess. Uh, and then she takes one look down the aisle and she's like, oh, mm, I'm not really sure about this. And then we've got the grandmother there on the right hand side trying to coax her down, uh, which I love. I like that as well. OK, so this picture is uh, is, is really a one I love also. This is shot on the Fujifilm X70, which is a tiny, tiny little camera. Um, now, what happens to mo if you shoot weddings, which many of you do, I'm sure you'll you'll probably Come across the car drivers um you know they, they turn up and they say do you want me to wind the window down and allow the bride and groom to have a glass of champagne and stare at you through the window uh and i always say yes to that i always say yeah 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 that'd be lovely thanks go ahead um but i never take that picture of them staring through the window at me what i do at that point is i move away and then that brings everybody else in. Sometimes they'll look at me as if to say, are you not taking that picture? And I'll, maybe I'll go and hide behind a gravestone or something. But I, I allow everybody else to get involved. Um, and when everybody else gets involved, it starts to uh, unfold in front of you. So in this image, we've got obviously the bride and groom in the car. Um, we've got both sets of mums, we've got dad, we've got best man, we've got uh, both dads, in fact, we've got brother, everything, you know, and uh, it's a really nice kind of action picture, if you like, of something that perhaps would have been a little bit boring, if you ask me. Okay, so photography is easy, observing is the challenge. Um, you'll take better pictures and photos uh, and tell more remarkable stories by taking fewer photos and learning to see. Uh, this is something that I uh, you know, I'm really passionate about this as an idea. Um, you know, we all go to weddings as photographers and we all worry that, uh, you know, nothing's happening. Maybe nothing's happening. What should I do? Or I need to make it look like I've got a camera to my eye and I'm taking pictures of things that I know I'll never give to them. Um, and that's just pointless. I've done it. I do it myself. You know, I'm not, this isn't a kind of, uh, you shouldn't be doing this kind of thing. It's, it's a problem. It's a problem we have, psychological problem. And, uh, you know, your best bet and something that I've learned over the years is to put the camera down. Put the camera down, use your ears and your eyes, listen. Uh, I've even spent time recording the audio in particular rooms and then going away to, you know, to the loo or something and listening back to the audio. And that will tell you so many things. You know, you'll hear the, the chefs kind of shouting in the kitchen. You'll hear door salmon. You'll hear uh, kids crying in different rooms or having fun or, you know, laughter in corners. All those things that perhaps if you're too busy thinking, I've got to take pictures, I've got to take pictures, uh, you'll miss. So slow down, relax, and you know, look around the periphery of everything. And uh, every wedding, regardless how um, small or you know, perceivably not much happening, there's stuff going on. So here, for example, um, again, another image from several years ago, but that moment when they, you know, the bride and groom, they sit down, the registrar tell them to sit down, and uh, you know they interlink those things. They all do it. Everybody does it. I see it every single Saturday. I see this. Um, nobody else sees it, and the bride and groom will forget about it. 
but that's happening. You know, it's that little uh, reassurance to each other that, you know, they're both there, they both turned up. Um, they both, you know, about to have a beautiful day together and, uh, and, and hopefully an incredible rest of life. And so capturing those things, knowing they're going to happen, looking for them, and then being able to present those images to the clients really important. Uh, another one kind of uh, about interaction between people, really nice picture. Okay, first dance. So we all uh, we all obviously shoot the first dance generally, um, but once you've got the first dance picture, think about exploring the scene. Again, think about what's going on beyond it. Um, you, you probably want to include the first dance as part of a, a frame like this in terms of context. Um, but we've got, again, so much stuff going on here. We've got Super Proud Dad. Uh, we've got uh, people dressed in weird and wonderful, beautiful clothes. We've got a seven foot man in the background. Uh, we've got, uh, you know, there's a lady right in the middle who's staring directly at me and uh, <laughs> making a face at me. Uh, we all kinds of stuff going on here. But if I was busy concentrating just on the first dance and getting 20, 30 pictures of which I might only give them one, then uh, you know I'm not seeing this stuff. I'm not observing. Similar thing here. You know we're we're on the periphery of bridal prep. Uh, everything is going on uh, during a ceremony. Beautiful little bridesmaids with kids. Typically they're the only ones that I'm happy for. Um, I'm, I'm really happy when they look directly at the camera usually because they have that sense of, uh, of awe and wonder rather than wondering about what they're going to look like on Instagram. Um, you know, I think that's a, that's a nice picture. This, this image makes me smile as well. Again, another nervous bridesmaid looking, perhaps looking back for her mum, thinking, oh, I'm not sure about this. And we've got a little lad who's, who's given the other bridesmaid a little bit of a nudge. Go on, you go first. Go on. I told you, I'm going to go last. You go first. And it's all, all a little bit of a... A chaotic scene there but shooting it from behind I'm thinking about the light um, and uh, the light is important you see from the other side we don't have any lights on these kids or not, not much natural light falling on them um, and of course there's a lot of serendipity in this there's a lot of luck um, that happens with the moment you can't control the moment you can only control your positioning your understanding of the light and your composition uh, everything else the, the, these are the actors on the stage um, you know you have to rely on them to, to do their things and she just glances back and there we are it's a you know it's a nice picture it's a really nice black and white image there uh, stuff like this as well you know padding around in the uh, uh, venue just before the wedding looking out for all of these uh, uh, kind of um, details the stuff that they won't see they simply won't see this you know the uh, the organizers are all doing all of this um, there's a little bit of kind of uh, humor in it, but also there's a very much a sense of reality in this. Um, so, uh, yep, this kind of thing as well. You know, we're looking for that uh, people being people, and uh, you know, over the shoulder and a uh, little snap of the of the uh, speech that he's about to give, uh, a little sneak peek of his uh, awful sense of humor. Okay, light. I've alluded to this a few times uh, as we go through. Now light is, uh, when I first started, light was my enemy, but light is is always, always our friend, natural light, available light I'm referring to here. Of course, you may use flash and by all means do that and enjoy that. Um, and you can control it, of course. But for me, I'm looking for, I'm really looking for um, opportunities to make uh, seemingly normal images uh, more powerful by the use of light. Um, so in this case, we have, uh, you know, the bride sat in front of a window and she's having the hairspray done, which I'm highly allergic to, which drives me nuts every wedding. Um, but, you know, by focusing on her, but then metering, taking my meter reading from a very much a lighter point of the frame, I can make something relatively artistic out of uh, something that's a pretty regular standard frame. Um, and so, you know, being able to see this is, is important. Same thing here, um, and we will, one of the tips towards the end when we get to the, you know, the kind of technical element, if you like, is, is this idea of using spot metering. Um, and Sasko has, has just asked, you know, can you tell us about your camera settings? Um, and we will get to that. But ultimately, the, the most important thing and the, the, the best thing that I can advise you is to, uh, is to understand spot metering in your camera if you're not shooting fully manually. Um, allow the camera to take some element of control over the exposure um, and you'll be able to see, be able to utilize that light really powerfully. Similar thing here, we have this one from again, very, very long time ago, um, a beautiful picture. 
Okay, this is a more recent one, just before Christmas also, uh, maybe September time. Um, and uh, again, this is another example of the details of the dress, you know, so the light is lovely, falling lovely on the, on the wedding dress, uh, using that spot meter in mode to make the most of the details with the light on it. Um, we get that shot that, uh, you know, the bride's actually said to me, she, you know, she really loves that picture. Um, and that to me is more, more important um, than perhaps having it in a very formal, uh, you know, hanging on the wardrobe door or something. Okay, back in that same wedding, that light, uh, we're talking about light waiting for the dad. Remember, um, I was behind her at one point and now we're literally waiting for him to walk through that door. The uh, wedding plan has just gone to get him. Um, another opportunity to see something in the mirror and take the shots. And yeah, of course, you know, what we have here is uh, the makeup artists have left their uh, hair things, whatever they are. Uh, there's a Marks and Spencer's bag down there, all kinds of stuff. But that is real. That's what's there. Um, you know, if I decide to go and move all of that stuff, unplug those plugs, move the bag and everything, then the moment's gone, totally gone. Um, back on the dance floor, available light again. So, you know, usually my, I get asked that a lot about, you know, dance floor and the light and all of that kind of stuff. And yes, I have my, my little LED light for when I need it. But in most cases, uh, they, you know, the light source is set up, they, you know, the DJs will either have some uh, funky lighting or the, you know, there's stuff going on in the, in the, in the roof. Um, so make the most of it, do what you need to do. Um, in this case, I'm desperately trying to get the, the, uh, the singer and the guitarist, uh, in the frame at the same time as the, um, bride and groom who are just literally just finishing their first dance. And they would said, you know, everybody else come onto the dance floor. Um, and that's the point where you st you're worrying that you haven't got what you need from the first dance. You could be concentrating too much on the other people, um, but then it comes together. Okay, so uh, storytelling. This is your this is the, the the way that you can tell a story at anything. It doesn't have to be a wedding. It could be the story of your day. Five W's. Again, I have this written on the inside of my camera bag. Who, why, what, where, and when. If you're really struggling, thinking how can I go beyond making uh, snapshots to making a story, then think about those five W's. Who's there, why are they there, what are they doing, where are they, when are they? Uh, you know, so you're thinking about the weather, the environment, the time, the venue, the, the, uh, the road signs, uh, everything that connects the dots between uh, like bridal prep to the venue, for example, if the bridal prep is going on in somebody's house or parents' house, I'll invariably stop and, and, and get a shot of the road sign. You know the, the the street sign outside, the door, the front door, the cars outside, all of these things that will remind them of their uh, of the place that they, they, they grew up generally. Um, really important and you know you'll you will be thanked for that kind of uh, thought process. Okay, what can we learn from Tony Ray Jones? And Tony Ray Jones is a uh, he's dead unfortunately, but when he died they they found these uh, notes in his camera bag. Uh, and what you'll see is that a lot of the stuff we've talked about in this session is very similar to what Tony Ray Jones was constantly telling himself. Uh, you can read it there, be more assertive, get more involved, stay with the subject, take simpler pictures, watch the background, beware of composition, don't take boring pictures, don't overshoot, getting closer. Um, so even the great Tony Ray Jones wrote notes to himself and stuck him in his camera bag. Um, and that's, that's a, a really good thing, really good tip, I think. All right, so I'm gonna show you my very, very favorite, my most favoritist ever wedding photo uh I, uh taken a very very long time ago this was with the fujifilm x pro one on a 60 mil macro lens because uh, that's uh, pretty much all i had in those days um and this is a we wedding in uh i can't even remember where it was but it's it was a beautiful beautiful day and the reason why i love this picture so much is because this is what it's all about isn't it isn't this what we want to be all like uh you know when uh when it's you know we're kind of in the limelight, or uh, no, the twilight, if you like, um, you know, it's grainy, it's a little bit dark in places, you've got lots of hot spots, you've got like exit signs, things like that. Um, but really, that's a that's a, an image that is all about the emotion between uh, two people. And, you know, I really, really love that uh, picture. And it is still my favorite picture ever. Okay, so uh, a few tips for a successful business. Um, of course, the most important thing is, uh, you know, is basically hard work. There's no shortcuts, um, but uh, minimal gear really helps. So for me, uh, touching on what I shoot with, 
I moved from a DSLR system back in 2011 or 12, that, that period of time. Um, and it was the brilliant camera system. You know, you, you'll never hear me kind of knock in different camera systems. Um, and I, I went to a smaller mirrorless system, just so happened to be Fujifilm. But right now, of course, you've got Sony, Panasonic, Canon, Nikon. They all offer smaller mirrorless cameras. Um, but it really, really helps. So I shoot with two relatively small cameras, an X-Pro3 and an X-T4 an 18mm f1.4 and a 56mm 1.2 lens. Uh, literally 100% of my shots are taken on those two lenses. Uh, or 99%, I should say, the, the X70, X100V are in my pocket, in my jacket pocket, just in case something happens to the other two generally. Um, sometimes the X70 is is pretty cool because it's, it's a little bit wider and you can lift it above your head and things like that. But yes, travel light, try, you know, really try and not get bogged down in thinking, I must have a lens, a length of lens to cover all, uh, you know, all scenarios, because you probably don't. Um, the less gear you have, the less equipment, then uh, the the more enjoyable the day will be for a start, and the more um, cohesive type images you're going to get throughout your career. Number two, seeing in black and white. Now this is uh, really, 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 really powerful. A um, couple of things to say about this. You will only be able to do this if you are using a mirrorless camera and you have a uh, uh, electronic viewfinder. Most mirrorless cameras have electronic viewfinders. Some of them have both optical and electronic. Um, if you switch your display to black and white in the camera, you will then be seeing in black and white. Now, one thing to be super, super careful of, if you're just shooting JPEG, then your images will all be in black and white. OK, don't blame me. Um, but if you're shooting RAW plus JPEG or you're just shooting RAW, then your RAW images, of course, will always be in color um, unless you're using a monochrome only sensor. Um, so being able to see in black and white, all of those images we talked about in the light section, um, I'm seeing those images in the camera. Yes, there's editing in terms of maybe darkening down uh, uh, corners and various things like that. But ultimately, I can meter and expose directly in the camera for the light and the shadow. And it will definitely make your black and white images specifically better, but also I think you'll find your color images as well because you'll be able to get a better, stronger uh, stronger uh, exposure. Okay, next up is remember the social in social media. Um, social media is uh, you know a much maligned uh, marketing practice and it is a marketing practice but also you know just remember to be social everything I, I'm forever telling my kids that no matter every single thing that goes public on the internet will be there forever so remember it um, so if you're on uh, Twitter kind of slagging off football team or politician or whatever then it's it's likely to come back to haunt you at some point um, but more importantly you know if you think about Instagram I had a, we had a very long conversation on a, on a podcast that I run recently about you know how Instagram is not good because nobody sees the pictures anymore it's all about reels and various things like that and it's not you know I uh, I wish I was going through my stats the other day and out of my last 15 bookings over the however many last months have been six of them were uh, Instagram leads and came from Instagram uh, and and I think the most important thing to remember with Instagram is, uh, you know, play by the rules. And, um, you know, I see a lot of people who, who put like 20 hashtags at the bottom of a post or they put dot, 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 and all the hashtags are at the bottom. Or they put the hashtags in a, you know, in, a, in another comment or they go around and comment on loads of other posts because they then think that that will drive them back there. And it won't. It, it really won't. You know, it's the people who, uh, who write the code for Instagram are a lot cleverer than all of us. And if they see dot, 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 because you're trying to hide the hashtags, they're just going to you know, laugh at you at best and maybe give you a, a bit of a kick at the butt in terms of the rankings at, at worst. So just do it. Honestly, I typically will do three or four hashtags. Um, I'll write a nice piece of text with every image. I don't post reg that regularly. Um, and I always reply to the comments if, they're, you know, if, they, if they demand a reply. Um, and, uh, and it works. It really does work. But it's, it's important to remember that it is social media. It's not guerrilla marketing media. Back button focusing and spot metering. We did touch on this and a couple of questions have come up that I've seen about uh, technique. Um, now, uh, back button focusing and spot metering is a technique where you will use the AFL button on the back of your camera to lock the focus. All cameras will have that. 
Um, spot meter in, all of your cameras will also have a meter in um, mode, uh, average, center weighted, all of that kind of stuff. Spot meter in is where it's going to build the exposure based on a very small element of the frame, wherever you're kind of hovering your camera, if you like. Meter in will only kick in if you're shooting in one or more of the auto mode, so either aperture priority, shutter priority, auto ISO, or two or three of those. If you're shooting in fully manual mode, you are the meter. But being able to lock the focus in one place, just twist the camera slightly a meter from somewhere else, and if you're looking at the, looking at your image in uh, black and white, you it's going to open up a whole new world to you. Um, if you haven't done that before, what I suggest you do is practice, even at home, you know, put your camera into back button focusing mode, however your camera d uh, demands that, um, pop it in spot meter mode, just play around in the living room, look at, you know, watch what happens when you move the camera over the TV screen, for example, and then over to a wall and look at how you can lock the focus on maybe the corner of the TV screen and get the meter reading from somewhere else. And you'll get images that will, uh, you know, will, will be far more powerful and it's really quick to do. Cohesive look and editing style. Uh, so we're going to do a little bit of editing now. Hopefully we've got a bit of time. Um, and uh, it's important to keep that very, very simple. Edit everything to look the same. Uh, and that will help you also if you're using just two lenses or two uh, focal lengths. Um, but the editing is, is really important. Okay, so before I bump into Lightroom, um, this is the, obviously this is a BenQ webinar um, and you are all entitled and welcome to go to camerascenteruk.com, get 5% off BenQ uh, SW monitors when using the code BenQ5, offer is valid until 4th of April. Um, and there you go. So uh, I am using BenQ 32-inch um, monitor and the Calibrite Color Checker Display Pro, which you can see, just about see in that screen there, um, for uh, color calibration, which is really critical. And one of the things that I get asked a lot is, although you do a lot of black and white work, Kev, do you, um, is color calibration still important? And yeah, it's probably even more important because I have seen awful, awful casts on my own images uh, if I've edited on image on uh, monitors that are not color calibrated. So very, very important if you're a professional photographer and of course important to have a uh, decent screen for editing on. Okay, so um, I'm going to jump into Lightroom. I'm going to show you a, uh, a very quick way of uh, kind of doing some editing. And there's a link there to um, the smart collections that I'm about to show you. They're totally free on the website. Um, so now you might have to tell me whether you can see Lightroom or not when this comes up, whether I need to reshare. Uh, Alexandra, can you tell me if you can see Lightroom? Can somebody tell me if I, you can see Lightroom? yeah yes oh there we go right cool all right so i've just got a handful of images from the wedding that you've seen um now this these smart collections here most people if you use lightroom will know about smart collections i have these here uh they're the standard ones but you can build your own smart collections really very easy to do um and if you use a workflow method of editing um, built into smart collections you can get through things very quickly like i said you can go to my website and download these totally for free um, and essentially because we're strapped for time I'm going to show you roughly what I would do this would probably be nearer 400 pictures of course um, for a whole wedding uh, rather than the, the, the 15 or so I've got here but I would come in the first thing and the critically the most important thing for all of the images is to get the exposure correct and the white balance even if they're going to be black and white images you want to be doing your exposure get your exposure right sort your white balance out um, however that's going to be, get those things done first of all, even for black and white. Color corrected monitor, white balance, really, really important. So we'll do that for each of the images, however many we have. Um, I'm not going to do it for all of them, of course, um, and you just go through and do that. Now, where the smart collections come in really useful is this uh, editing element of it here. So we have numbers. So numbers on the, the keyboard. I will go through and I'll decide, first of all, which ones I'm going to edit for color and which ones I'm going to edit for black and white. So I'll simply press three on my keyboard for color uh, and then four on my keyboard for black and white. So obviously, I'm, you take more care about this when you're doing it. So as you can see here, I can now kind of go for coffee or whatever and I've, you know, I've decided already which images are going to be color, which images are going to be black and white. 
I can then uh, come back the next day or later or just get straight on with it, uh, click on the uh, smart collection that's uh, relevant, and you can do one of two things here. Obviously, again, remember you are going to have your uh, images all um, exposure corrected. You can apply a preset, uh, whether whichever preset you have, um, a uh, standard Lightroom one or third-party one or your own one. Um, and effectively, that's your that's your step. Your your main build that preset, and I'm going to very quickly show you a black and white build a black and white preset for you in a second. Apply that there and do the same thing then for these ones. So for the sake of argument, I am just very simply going to go to this one. Standard uh, color, anyone really? Uh, okay. And then effectively, I would then go through and just mark them again, eyeball each one, make sure that they you know, they dodged and burned correctly and all that kind of stuff. And then mark them as number one or number two, depending on whether they're black or white color. And then they're done, they're edited. Um, and then that smart collection set will help you go right the way through that. So what we'll do first though, uh, or finally I should say, is I'll show you how I, how I would build a basic black and white preset in Lightroom. The same principle will apply for um, Capture One and various other things. Um, so there's lots of ways in Lightroom you can do this. You can just click black and white, you can drop the saturation, all of those various things are, are okay. What I prefer to do is go to the, um, Profiles, and I'm not going to pick one of the black and white um, camera profiles. Where are they? They're down the bottom. So I'm looking for um, camera specific. Here we go, camera matching. So whatever your camera you've, you've chosen will have uh, your camera matching profiles in here. I'm not going to choose a black and white one. I'm actually going to use a punchy uh, color one. Okay, so in this case, we'll go for classic chrome. All right, so I've applied a classic chrome filter, which is in the Fujifilm cameras. Next thing I'll do is drop the saturation. Okay, so we've got classic chrome, saturation taken away. And then your friend at all times is this wonderful tone curve, simple S curve, somewhere like that. Okay, get that right. And then to give it the little bit of drama that it probably deserves, a bit of clarity. Okay, and then you'll finish the image off as you, as you so wish. So things like shadows, highlights, exposure, all of that shouldn't be in a preset really. Um, that should be done on an individual basis. So I might bring that up there. Uh, and there we go, we're good to go. Right, okay, I know I really appreciate I went a little bit over. So I'm gonna put my, my face back on, get ready, uh, cover your eyes. And there we go. Um, and now we have to do the questions. <laughs> if you're still hanging around, I'm really sorry. Uh, okay, so let me see what we had. Let's see, let's see, let's see. Uh, a question from Adrian. Hi, Kevin. How do you manage the issue of group shots uh, when meeting prospective clients, please? Well, that's all about branding, really. So um, ultimately, the clients that come to me realize that that's not my focus. Um, I'd say 60% of my clients still have two or three group shots, but that's it. Literally, um, the rest have none, and the others maybe have two or three. Um, but it really is a branding thing. Don't uh, you know? Just don't show stuff on your website that you don't want to shoot. Okay, simple as that. And uh, make sure your branding and your marketing message is strong. And there are, for every person that wants 25 group shots out there, clients, there's a client that wants zero group shots. You have to align yourself with those people. Um, Daniel asked, do we ever use flash? And we answered that, no. So I use a little LED um, light. Um, question from Jay, are you zone focusing? Sometimes, very good question actually. So zone focusing is a technique where you are setting a distance uh, in manual focus mode, maybe two meters in front of you to five meters. I will sometimes do that if I'm in a very, very busy environment. So a very busy drink reception or something um, where you know there's a lot of people going on and it's very hard to, to kind of uh, tell a story as such. So I might zone focus, put the camera just around chest level um and and see what i can get um but typically i'm using um back button focusing locking my focus i'm always using that um and then uh, shooting that way okay we have uh martin says if you think of yourself as a guest does that mean you chat to the bride and groom as a guest 
Would you try more to fade into the background? Uh, no, of course I chat to them. Um, I don't, you know, I don't go up to them and ask them, you know, how their holidays were and all that kind of stuff. But you know, we, of course I chat and I'll chat to you know the other guests and everything like that. But it's not, um, you know, I, when I say think of yourself as a guest, I mean uh, try and get guest eye images, dress like a guest, for example. Try not to go dressed as a ninja. Um, you know, and uh, if it's a black tie wedding, I'll wear, I'll go in a black tie. Um, if it's fancy dress, I did once go to a wedding dressed as a crocodile, then, you know, I'll do that. But yeah, I mean, I'm there to do a job and uh, it's, uh, it's, it's not a case of, we're not invisible people. We can't be invisible. Um, so, you know, you can't just kind of hide on the sidelines because actually the less, the more that you, you don't interact with people um, and that might just simply be a smile or, you know, sometimes you hold the door open for people and say, I hope you have a nice day and all that kind of stuff. Um, then that's, that's the interaction, isn't it? Uh, okay, are you using uh, RAW files and editing them or JPEGs, uh, RAW files, uh, the feature film equivalent, RAW files? Um, these days I shoot JPEG plus RAW um, and mostly I'll edit from the RAW files with the presets. Um, but I, up until probably the X-Pro3 came along, then I was uh, shooting and, and editing a lot from JPEG. Um, really doesn't matter. I mean, I've found that I've I've managed to get with raw files um, really nice set of presets that work for me. So I'm using those for uh, for editing at the moment. But ultimately, it doesn't matter, does it? Because they all go out as JPEGs at the end. And if you can get from the JPEGs what you want and what your clients want, then uh, everybody's happy. Uh, okay. Do you always use primes? Says Martin. Yes, always use primes. Uh, I never use Zooms at weddings ever. Uh, doesn't mean you can't, I just don't. Um, oh, a couple of people have pointed out that I spelled Kappa wrong on the Robert Kappa quote. There you go. Uh, I'll fix that. <laughs> uh, I think that might be it. Uh, oh, hang on. Uh, Nick says, how did you get your foot in the door to your first wedding? Or how did you get your foot in the door to the first wedding? Um, so I, I basically did some second shooting or a, a kind photographer helped me out, put a website together. And bear in mind, this was uh, I don't know, 14 years ago, 12, 14 years ago. Um, and websites were my background. I, I did have a very lucky break in that respect. Um, but yes, you need to you need to get your foot in the door, of course. Uh, which comes first, the chicken or the eggs scenario? Uh, Jonathan, any tips for super dark venues without not much natural light at all? Yeah, spot metering. Uh, if it's light enough for people to see, it's light enough for you to take pictures in. Um, however, you are going to have to work harder for it. Um, think about where those lights are coming from. The, the, you know, move yourself around. Think about where the, the source of light. Um, uh, ultimately, you know, don't be afraid. If you want to use flash or LEDs or whatever, use them um, if you really need to. But I, I'm a strong believer that. You, you know, if it's light enough for people to see, then you want to be giving them that ambience. These days, modern cameras these days, the, noise, uh, the ISO levels are insane. So you can you can clean up a lot of things. Tamara says, how long do you usually stay at a wedding if it lasts all night after 2 a.m.? <laughs> uh, this is Britain, don't you know? Um, everybody goes home at 11 o'clock carriages. Um, uh, typical coverage, probably I'm usually there around about uh, 45 minutes for bridal prep. Um, and obviously it depends on if the ceremony is in the same place as where the product prep is getting ready. Um, and normally it depends. I have different coverages. So people can pay for um, midnight or last dance coverage. Um, I'd say probably one in every 10 clients book that. Most people go for first dance, plus I usually hang around for an hour after the first dance. So let's just say it's a typical two o'clock wedding, bridal prep might be midday, um, first dance might be at eight o'clock, and I'll probably be leaving about nine. And go nine ten hours something like that uh, miguel says how do you figure out the relationship between the numerous guests i can imagine you don't want to take a nice picture of two people that hate each other right uh yeah literally doesn't bother me um i if if they wanted to invite people who hated each other to the wedding that's their choice if they happen to be looking at each other and liking each other there then i'll take a picture of it but yeah i don't i don't i don't worry i don't um yeah, it's obvious who's mum and dad and all that kind of stuff you get a good idea of who's sat at the front of the ceremony all of that kind of stuff um but yeah i, I i'm not responsible for the the guest list <laughs> luigi says do you let the spaces to express their preferences for black and white or color or is that all your choice? 
Um, no, it's my choice. But ultimately, so if you look at my website and stuff, you'll see that my web, my blog, and my albums and everything are delivered in this mechanism called Islands of Color. Um, so if bridal prep is, you know, all of bridal prep will either be in black and white and cut co or color, all of the outside stuff will either be in black and white or color, all of the inside will, or the ceremony will be either black and white or color, etc. Um, and yeah, you can, you can deal with it as you, as you so wish. I also, um, uh, allow people to pay for having images in all color and all black and white. So that does it. Ultimately, though, take key takeaway, you must make sure you're doing wedding photography on the level where you enjoy it um, and really, really try and understand the fact that you are there to be an observer. You need to understand how to take photos, obviously, but you're an observer, tell a story, um, and hopefully everything will be good. Make sure you've got color calibrated BenQ monitors as well. Uh, I think that's it. Thank you very much. I think it's up to me to just close the the session down, or maybe Alexandra will do it. I'm not sure. Ah, there we go. That's it. We're done. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Bye. 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 Bye.